Welcome, Welcome. From, alpha from Alpha to Omega. To Omega. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the 52nd episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Saturday, the 16th of August, 2014, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This week's show is brought to you by the very generous monthly subscribers, Precious J, Derek McH, Ambrose A, Amir H, and Jeffrey S. To help keep the show's warp drive from experiencing fluctuations in their plasma injectors, why not click on that there donate button on the podcast website? This week, I am delighted to welcome to the show Professor Peter Hudis of Oakton Community College. We discuss the professor's new book, Marx's Concept of the Alternative to Capitalism, and find out what Marx had to say about what a post-capitalist society would look like. We also discuss the reluctance of those on the left to talk about what a socialist future might actually look like, the theoretical reasons for the failure of the Soviet and Maoist projects, and how not even the capitalists are in control of the current system. We join the conversation as Peter tells us all about his latest trip to China. Well, they uh, had something at the Wuhan University called, believe it or not, the Rosa Luxemburg Summer School. It was a week-long series of uh, seminars on uh, Marxist theory, focused on the work of Rosa Luxemburg, but also discussions of Western Marxism, critical theory, and independent Marxist tendencies and theories. So um, they set up at Wuhan University, they had students and faculty from about 20 different colleges around China. First time they ever did anything like this, as you can imagine, this would have been unthinkable 20 years ago in China, you know, because she was persona non grata, but uh, there's actually a growing interest in her work in China. There's a lot of people uh, interested in it. The, the summer school was at Wuhan University, and then I got to travel to some other places as well. I've been, this is my third trip to China, and they're opening up a lot of interesting new discussion there now. Wuhan University is in the city of Wuhan. It's central China. It's due west of Shanghai, maybe about 200 miles shy of Jian. So it's a little bit east of Jian, but quite a bit west of Shanghai. It's a city of about 10 million. It's uh, one of the top two or three universities in China. And it's especially renowned for its philosophy department. The Wuhan is also known, of course, famously or infamously, this is where uh, the Cultural Revolution started in 60. Mao started the Cultural Revolution there in 65 with his famous uh, a swim across the Yangtze River. So it's really part of the industrial area of China as well, but it's also the biggest university but it's also the heart of the pollution. So it's, you got you got everything there. I've been in China for two weeks. I never saw the sun come out, and I just was assuming it's the uh, humidity or something, and I asked somebody, and they said, no, it's not the weather, it's the pollution. They don't see the sun come out like just a couple of days of during the summer. I mean, you can just smell the coal burning power plants and everything else. I mean, it's this enormous expansion that's going on there. But it's going to be slower now. Why is there such a reluctance on the left, do you think, about talking about what a socialist future might actually look like. People say like Sander Bear, Noam Chomsky, for example, he's practically, as I can see, allergic to talking about such things. Hey, it's funny you mentioned that many years ago, I, I asked Chomsky directly that very question. He had come to Chicago. We had known each other from years earlier and stuff around the Middle East and such. And we had a little discussion and I said to him, this must have been the early 90s, it was quite a while ago. And I said, you know, uh, when, no, you're going to start talking about the other things that you can talk about. I mean, because, you know, yes, certainly thoughts about broader critique of capitalism and alternatives to capitalism. And uh, you never do it in these public presentations. And he said, well, he says, if I ever get around to giving that lecture, I'll let you know. But that's a completely different subject than what I'm working on. <laughs> that wasn't much of an answer. But more seriously, I think some of the reason is because, frankly, it's much easier to critique what's in front of you than to figure out what's the alternative. That requires a greater amount of daring, given the fact that what was accepted as the predominant understanding of what's the alternative to capitalism has proven to be non-viable. So it, see, it didn't seem necessary to talk about a post-capitalist society for decades because more or less everybody seemed to take for granted they knew what the answer already was. 
socialized ownership of means of production, elimination of the free market, state control of the economy, etc. Right. So it just didn't seem to be important to discuss because it seemed that either one, the contradictions of capitalism would somehow sui generis bring forth a socialist alternative on its own. Or secondly, what the alternative was, was pretty evident according to the discussions that have been going on for a full century. But I think it's only when those alternatives exhausted themselves, uh, and that became obvious already as early as the early 1980s, you didn't have to wait till 89 for that, but that certainly made it even more obvious, then the, the absence of this articulation of alternative became more obvious, but it becomes much more difficult to do. I think it's connected to the question of why many people, including Chomsky, don't really critique capitalism per se. I mean, they critique aspects of capitalism. U.S. policy, social inequality, unequal distribution. These are all important things to criticize, of course. But that doesn't get to the heart of what capitalism really is, right? And we've had several decades of a, of a decline of explicit critique of the law of motion of capital. And the reason for that is it's very hard to critique it if you're not going to be able to provide a sense of what the alternative to it. So I mean, I just think that there has been an overall crisis of imagination that has afflicted the radical movement uh, once uh, the existing alternatives were exposed as not being viable, and uh, the amount of, frankly, rethinking from bottom up that it takes is quite laborious to come up with an answer, and it's much easier to take another approach. So the type of existing socialism or communism that was around in the, you know, in the 60s and 70s in Soviet Russia and places like these, did Marx have a critique of that style or model of socialism in his day? Well, not directly, of course, because I think Marx would have been quite astonished to learn that something like Stalinism emerged in, in his name. I mean... Uh, nobody anticipated the emergence of Stalinism. That was true also in 1917 in Russia. I mean, nobody saw that coming. That's what made it such a shock and why that entire generation of revolutionaries uh, were so bewildered and succumbed to the emergence of Stalinism. So on that level, no, I think Marx was more confident that in general that there would be uh, an effective transcendence of the capital relation, not this sort of thing that we've experienced. But nevertheless, there are indications in Marx's work when he critiques other socialists of his day in which he sees tendencies, tendencies he was taking in his day, their positions, actually he was capturing the logic of where their position could lead, and ultimately they did in the 20th century. So even though he's not directly critiquing, not directly expecting Stalinism or the state, what I would call state capitalist bureaucratic type of societies, there's plenty of indications of his work where he is very dissatisfied with other socialists because he thinks that their answer to the question of what constitutes an alternative to capitalism will not lead to an improvement of society. I'll just mention three examples. First is in the 1844 manuscripts, he has a critique of what he called crude, unthinking, stupid communism. Yes, that is critiquing those who think the abolition of private property by itself suffices to create a socialist society. It's a rather savage critique, and uh, it's been a lot of debate over who exactly is he critiquing. Who were these crude communists? Were they people in the Communist League? Were they people, utopian socialists like Fourier or Cabet, etc.? But actually, I think, though that somebody he was responding to such tendencies, I think Marx was also simply thinking out the logic of a position. Because one thing he critiques in 1844 in the course of this critiquing crude communism are those who advocate the community of women. That is, instead of the private ownership of women by a hierarchical male-dominated family, Women would be collectively owned by some sort of cooperative or community, and he, of course, denounces that as universal prostitution. But there was nobody that I know of among the utopian socialists who actually advocated community of women in 1844. So who was he exactly critiquing? Was he critiquing simply existing tendencies, or was he thinking out the logic of certain positions where they could lead if left to their own devices? The second, and even more direct, would be his critique of Proudhon, which begins in 1844, but is much fuller in his 1847 Poverty of Philosophy, where he critiques Proudhon and his followers for thinking that organizing exchange relations or introducing organization into anarchic market relations constitutes an alternative to capitalism. There, I think, in Marx's critique of Proudhon, you can see a lot of anticipation 
of a critique of status, so-called socialism in the 20th century. Not that Proudhon himself would have favored those regimes either. But again, it's the logic of the position that you eliminate capitalists, but not capital. You eliminate market anarchy, but not the hierarchical domination of capital over labor at the point of production. Marx was trying to show where this kind of position could lead to, and he was extremely disconcerted about it. And then third, uh, much more to say about it, I'll just be brief, at the end of his life, in volume three of Capital, actually, which actually he wrote, drafted this part before he actually published volume one, but still, it's in the 1860s, he speaks of capitalist communism, his phrase. That is, those who seek the abolition of private property, but without transforming the actual social relations that are constituted by value production. And he says it's an effort to kind of communalize property relations without transforming production relations. And he says this can lead to a kind of capitalist communism, a phrase that he uses several times in volume three of capital. So there's a lot of indications in Marx's work of his dissatisfaction with existing socialist tendencies. Of course, none of them held state power in his lifetime. It's only after his death that some of the um, positions or approaches that he was earlier critiquing now were able to be implemented. And then we saw uh, some really horrible uh, results of that. So I suppose we need to talk then a bit about value creation and what exactly is going on there. Yes, this is a difficult question, and it's a question that trips up a lot of people, largely because one has to be clear on terms first. Because, first of all, value is not the same as material wealth. If I plant uh, my basil in my backyard and I harvest it through the fruits of my own labor and then perhaps invite friends over to my um, pesto dinner, there is no value production involved in this. But there is a production of material wealth. And many people conflate material wealth with value. Uh, value is a specific form of, of wealth. It's a form of wealth that assumes a monetary expression, an abstract monetary expression. So if I take my basil and then I decide that I'm going to sell my basil and start a business and generate profit from this, and then uh, my sale of this commodity takes on, so to speak, a value form of its own in which market prices determine how much I can produce, when I can produce, the form in which I produce, I become dominated ultimately by my own product. Even my activity will become dominated by the value form of the product. So value is not the same as material wealth. Marx makes it very clear in many of his works that the notion of value production is alien to pre-capitalist societies. Pre-capitalist societies based upon use values. But here again, there's a terminology issue that confuses people. When Marx talks about use value, use value is not a form of value. Use value is a form of material wealth. It's an unfortunate phrase almost. I almost sometimes think I would like to replace the word by use worth, but it's a very awkward expression. Use value is not a form of value. Value is abstract. Use value is concrete. You have a concrete need. You need shoes. Okay, so here is the shoes that are going to be produced to satisfy that need. One use value producing a useful desire or need. That's a, that's part of material wealth. It's concrete. Pre-capitalist societies, Marx says, did not know production for the sake of augmenting or increasing value. They had production for the sake of augmenting or increasing the quantity of use values. And of course, there were very hierarchical societies in many cases and exploitative because the ruling class wished to obtain as many use values as possible at the expense of the producers. So there is exploitation in pre-capitalist societies. So a feudal lord, for example, would say take some of the production of, say, the serfs on their land, but it wasn't as if they were taking money in any real sense, but it was more the use of the produce. Yes, they were expropriating a portion of the useful produce of the peasant and also a portion of the concrete labor of the peasant, right? Because uh, feudal dues involved not only turning over so much of the percentage of the crop at harvest time, but there was also a labor tax called a labor in which the peasant had to give three weeks or three months or what have you, or in some cases much more, period of time of their year, unpaid to the Lord in exchange for the protection that the Lord would provide him living on the manor. So there was an exchange of services, an unequal exchange of services, of course, but it was all based on quantities of use value, whether as measured in 
a labor input or whether as measured in a, a product, an amount of product. Now, capitalism changes all of this, of course, right? No medieval serf thought that they were equal to their master. No slave ever thinks they'd be equal to their master because in pre-capitalist societies based on unequal uh, appropriation of use values, it's very obvious who produces the wealth and who consumes it at their expense. But the class relations are very transparent. The social relations are quite transparent. Even though they're very complicated, there's more than two classes, there's a very complex series of dues, obligations, etc., and many other societies as well that weren't feudal. But capitalism, on the one hand, simplifies all of this by turning everything into monetary remuneration, right? So now you're not giving over a quantum of use value to your superior. You're giving over a portion of your labor time that itself is computed monetarily. So it takes the form of an abstract equivalent. And now, because it takes the form of an abstract equivalent, the social relation is not transparent. It appears to you, perhaps, as a worker, that, well, I enter into a contractual relationship with my boss. I agree to work so many hours. He agrees to pay me so much money in exchange. There is an equal exchange. Unlike in feudalism, there's an appearance of equality. But, of course, this equality is based on a kind of uh, perverse relationship in which my value is determined by an abstract equivalent. It's not determined by the actually the amount of goods and services that I generate in material terms. It's generated by a social average. But let me just explain that just for a second, because that's a really key point. In capitalist societies, the value, well, let me put it this way. Popularizations of Marx often like to use this phrase, labor is a source of all value. Strictly speaking, this is wrong. According to Marx, labor as such is not the source of value. Only a specific kind of labor is the source of value. The kind of labor that is the source of value is abstract or undifferentiated labor. What does that mean? Well, if I'm working producing, let's say, a uh, automobile in a factory in Chicago, and it takes on average 18 hours, basically, to assemble this automobile, and then a factory opens up in China producing the same automobile, but the workers there produce it in 12 hours. The extra six hours of labor that I produce making that car in with my other colleagues in Chicago does not, from a capitalist point of view, count as creation of value. It's counted as wasted time because the value is determined, right? The value of a commodity is not determined by the actual amount of labor time that goes into producing it, but on the, the average amount of time that is socially necessary to create it. So it, it, the average amount of time that is necessary or needed to create the car is 12 instead of 18 hours. 12 hours of labor time counts as the value of the car, not 18, even if you employ somebody doing that car for 18 hours. In this example then, so when the Chinese car comes into the market and the American car comes into the market, because the Chinese car has, say, less labor costs, they're able to undercut the American car and sell theirs before the Americans will sell it all or they'll have to cut their prices and have less profit. So this is the law of competition coming in. Yes, the law of competition manifests or reveals to the agents of social production something going on behind their back that they otherwise have no knowledge of, right? Competition informs the agents of production that, that hey, you are, you are actually exceeding the amount of necessary labor time needed to produce this commodity. If you continue to do that, you'll be undersold by your competitor and you'll be driven out of business. Therefore, the agents of production respond by trying to reduce the amount of labor time required to, to uh, taken in producing that product in order to meet the abstract social average established by the world market. Which means that workers are constantly under pressure, of course, to work faster and harder or more technological innovation is introduced to produce more in a shorter amount of time. But the thing is, is that this entire process goes on behind the backs, not only of the workers, but also of the capitalists. Now, a third capitalist comes along with a new technological innovation and can produce the same car in, let's say, nine hours in somewhere else. Well, the laws of competition eventually will show that to be the new socially necessary labor time. You either respond to that lower average or you're going to get driven out of business. This is the secret, by the way, of globalization. What globalization effectively does is it takes down barriers between agents of capital and takes down the protective layer that prevented people from being subject to this competition. 
So you basically put every unit of capital in a position of competition around the world with every other unit of capital. Globalization is simply an instrument to communicate to the agents of production what is the socially necessary labor time needed to produce that commodity. So when the capitalists say, well, if we have protectionism, we're going to have a less efficient mode of production. From their point of view, they're absolutely correct. If you have protection, you don't get the information as to what is the socially necessary labor time. That average is not communicated to you. You're going to be producing less efficiently. With globalization, the information is communicated much more directly to the agents of social production, and they can respond accordingly. But what's the risk of the effect? The effect is there's this constant, unending drive to augment value at the expense of the creators of value. So the chronology of this system is such that the goods are produced, and then in the marketplace, this socially necessary amount of labor time is kind of determined through competition. And this then feeds back to the producers post the act of the production. So the decision on what they're producing, a lot of times it's, it's after the fact that they produce it, that they understand what's going on. Yes, but I would be a little more specific here and say it's not so much determined by the competition. It's really more determined by the level of technological innovation and the drive to increase or maintain rates of profit. So capitalists want to maintain or increase their rate of profit. No businessman goes into business not to earn a rate of profit, not to earn profit, of course. If they can earn more profit by lowering their labor costs or other costs, of course, they will do so. If they're forced to lower their labor costs in order to do so, they will, of course, do so. And very often how they respond when they are so forced is to technologically renovate or innovate at the, the production process to replace much of the living labor, the productive labor, by dead labor, by capital. Competition doesn't so much as determine that as express that. Competition is how this process becomes known. I think. So even if you try to organize competition, this was the big problem of the socialist movement. Many socialists thought, well, we can get at the problem by eliminating competition or organizing the exchange relationship to reduce or minimize the competition between different enterprises. We have a state plan and we manage it all rationally without these competitive pressures, you see? And the notion was that would create a more equitable and humane society. But the problem is they were dealing with the result and not the cause. They were dealing with the phenomena and not the essence, you see? The expression and not what drives the actual logic of the system. Because what drives the logic of the system is values insatiable drive to obtain more value. That is what Marx defined capital as, self-expanding value. So tinkering with the exchange relation, tinkering with the market, tinkering with the, the how much competition there is or isn't, this is only short-range kind of palliative kind of approaches. But Marx clearly uh, holds in the Grinvers and the Public Philosophy of the works where he talks about this more directly. Over the long haul, Capital will find a way to communicate to the agents of production, hey, you are not corresponding to the socially necessary labor time being established somewhere else in the rest of the world. You have to now reorganize in face of that. So in the Soviet example, say, for example, they were trying to build automobiles and maybe they wanted to export some of their automobiles because the capitalist system is really pounding on this, driving down the social necessary amount of labor time they in effect end up having to compete and having to essentially drive themselves down in the same way, even though it's owned by the state. Yes, of course, they delayed this for as long as they could. They delayed this for a long time. But you could take a country, this was the whole notion of socialism in one country, right? That you take a country the size of Russia, and then later, of course, this got applied to other countries, including as small as Cuba or some of the African countries, or North Korea for that matter. You isolate your country from the world market and presumably, uh, you try to re be self-reliant, right? And presumably, these negative effects wouldn't occur to you, right? They wouldn't impact you. That was the whole theory behind the uh, so-called socialist societies. But the problem, of course, that every one of them ran into and still run into is that they find themselves lacking any basic principle of technological innovation that emerges from within the productive system. In other words, they turn out to be very inefficient economic systems, there's no engine that really drives innovation. Now, they might copy innovations from the West, 
but they're always one step behind those innovations, you see. And the second and related problem is labor productivity is very low, right? Zhang Xiaoping discovered on this famous tour that he made in uh, the um, 1964 in China, he made a tour with Wu Xiaoqi uh, of the Chinese uh, economy, and they concluded that the uh, productivity of labor in China was dreadfully low, right? This is why he, even before the Cultural Revolution, started to push for free market reforms. Uh, the Soviets realized that they had this persistent problem of low productivity of labor of the Soviet workers. And in Cuba, of course, even Castro two or three years ago came out with the statement that, well, look at us, we've got like almost a million unproductive state-employed workers, and they're not doing anything. <laughs> and so now they're trying to shed a lot of these excess unproductive state workers. So eventually it catches up to you. So capitalists then, we can say they're not in control of this system. Absolutely. And this is the whole core why Marx said in his critique of Proudhon, in his critique of later LaSalle and other socialists of his time, he said, they argue against capitalists, but not capital. They try to save capital from the capitalists. Marx's critique of capitalism is not primarily a critique of capitalists, because he knows that the capitalists are no more in control of the system than the workers are. They, of course, they have more power at the point of production than the workers, right? They own the means of production. They can hire and fire. They can impose draconian conditions in employment and in many other political arenas. Yes, of course. But ultimately, they're not in control as much as they think because they have to respond to this autonomous form of value production, which is uncontrollable. That is, once you have value production, there is no way to control this process rationally, okay? The only approach is to eliminate its existence. So the big myth or the big illusion that I think the socialist movement largely suffered from in the 20th century is the notion that, and it still does to a large degree, that capital can be controlled. Now, if you think about the, the great interest in, it's a very serious book, but the great interest in Piketty's book, for instance, it feeds into this. Piketty basically, you know, lays out this very interesting uh, critique of the te capital's tendency towards inequality. And what does he say is the solution? Well, ultimately, the solution is not for him the abolition of capitalism, not the abolition of value production that he thinks is utopian. Instead, he thinks, well, uh, there should be some way to control capital by having a capital assets tax that's imposed internationally. Of course, it's very unclear who would do that, who would impose it, how it would be collected, and would the capitalists ever agree to a such a thing? But the assumption of the argument is that capital is controllable by some kind of rational agent, whether it be the state or an international federation or something. I think that's far more utopian, that approach, than creating the revolutionary uprooting of capital. What did Marx have to say then about a post-capitalist society? Yeah, well, that's the key question, and that's uh, what my book is about. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, first of all, it's a, a complicated issue for two reasons. One is that Marx himself never wrote a substantial body of, a piece of writing, I don't know, body of work, but a piece of writing on the subject. There's no book called Socialism. Of course, his main book is called Capital, a critique of capitalist mode of production. There's not even a, a full essay in which Marx discusses his a concept of the alternative to capitalism. And secondly, of course, What's very well known is Marx was very, very adverse to speculations about the future out of his own head. His famous comment, we don't need to write blueprints about the future. So it was taken for granted by uh, much of the Marxist movement that there was no real need to address a post-capitalist society. This was something the utopians did. Marxists don't do this. And instead, what Marxists do is simply follow out and discern the logic of capitalist development and ultimately, capitalism will, in one way or another, be compelled to give way to socialism, and the form of the future will be determined by the social formations uh, that are embedded within capitalism itself, as well as, of course, the social struggles of the workers against it. That would define the question for us. And that's, frankly, what I once believed, too. So let me just say a word about how I got to look at Marx differently. In the 80s, it became increasingly evident to a number of us that something had gone drastically wrong in the socialist project and that all of the existing notions of what constitutes a socialist society were pretty much bankrupt. I pretty much came to this conclusion by 1983. I was uh, very much influenced in this by Ryan Donievskaya, the founder of Marxist Humanism in the U.S., that termed 
the, the 1980s a changed world, in part because of this kind of situation, the exhaustion of anti-capitalist alternatives. So then the question became how to articulate and explore what an anti-capitalist alternative is. And very few people think to look back at Marx's work to try to work out that question because of the reasons I mentioned. But what occurred to me is if Marx is such a great critic of capital, which nobody denies, even any opponents of Marx, how can he be such a critic of capital if he didn't have some conception of what could exist in the absence of a society dominated by capital? In other words, if you make a critique of something, what drives you to critique it? You critique something because you don't like it, but why don't you like it? You don't like it because you have some conception of what is the alternative to what you don't like. If you didn't have that sense, even if it's a very unformed sense, you wouldn't engage in the critique at all. You can only critique something by negative contrast to what you favor. So it seemed to me that, well, there's got to be some notion that's in Marx's work that drove him to make this relentless critique of capital and that drove him to develop it the way he did. So with that in mind, I simply said, let me reread Marx from beginning to end and see if it's really true that he had nothing to say about the alternative to capitalism. And what I discovered is that scattered throughout his writings, neither in a systematic presentation, piece here, piece there, but it adds up to a lot of material, much more than I expected to find. Now, with that, I can go into some specifics, but I just wanted to give that little preliminary to give a feeling of why it's taken so long to even get to this issue. What did you reread? Well, I read, read basically everything. I went to the Gesamthausgabe, the Marx Engels Collective Works, the, the new version published in Amsterdam, earlier than that, uh, was uh, started in East Germany. It's an effort to publish pretty much everything Marx wrote. It's up to now, I think, 77 volumes. They've got like 20 more to go. There's still a, quite a number of things of Marx that have not yet seen the light of day in print yet. But I started from the very beginning, from his earliest writings, early 1840s, his doctoral dissertation, before he was even opposed to capitalism and tried to see what led him to a critique of capitalism, what were the normative or philosophical principles that was driving his critique through his economic philosophic manuscripts of 1844, his earlier work with the German ideology, and then the various drafts of capital. Marx spent something like 30 years working out his greatest theoretical work. He only finished one volume, but even that took him 30 years of writing and rewriting. And the various drafts of capital, there's quite a number of them, as well as capital itself, when you read them all through, you begin to see that he has numerous places where he says, well, here is what's wrong with capitalism. Now, this is how it would work. This is what could prevail if we did not have a capitalist mode of production. Some of this found its way into the published works. A lot of it didn't. When you put it all together, you've got a lot of material. And then I also did work, although I didn't discuss this as much in my book, is really the subject of an entire additional study. I didn't want to make my book too long. The last decade of his life, he had some very interesting things to say about non-capital, pre-capitalist, and non-Western societies, and what we can learn from them in terms of organizing a non-capitalist mode of production in the future. And that's a big issue that he was dealing with the last 10 years of his life. That must have taken a hell of a long time. To- <laughs> well, yes, but like I said, the book didn't take that long to write. But the research on it, like I say, in one way or another, I was interested in this topic from the 1980s. And I just decided to pull it together a few years ago. What were the main points that Marx said about a new system? Well, the main point that Marx, I think, is always trying to drive at is how do you uproot the system of value production? That is, capitalism is a system in which production is not geared for human need or human use. It's fundamentally geared to augment wealth computed in monetary terms. So, for instance, you know, General Motors doesn't make cars ultimately to make cars. Heinz doesn't produce food, packaged food for the sake of feeding people. And the University of Phoenix doesn't produce diplomas for the sake of educating people. Ultimately, all of them, like all capitalist enterprises, produce these material objects for the sake of augmenting value. And what Marx understood is that in capitalism, this becomes an end in itself. Because there's never enough value, right? Because value is an infinite magnitude can't get enough. I mean, there's only so much use values that you can consume, but there's an infinite magnitude of exchange value that could be accumulated. So capitalism is kind of a quest. It's like what Hegel called bad infinity. It's constantly chasing for an infinite accumulation of value. 
So what Marx asked is, where does that come from, that drive? Now, if you locate where that drive comes from, then you have an idea of, well, let's even use the word, what's the solution to the problem? Where the drive comes from, according to Marx, is, as he says, the peculiar social form of labor, I'm quoting him directly, that prevails in capitalist society. In capitalist society, the peculiar form of labor that characterizes capitalism is that labor is split in a twofold form between concrete labor and abstract labor. That is, that you are not only engaged in concrete acts of producing things, but in doing so, your labor also becomes homogenized. It takes on an abstract form because the labor that creates value, the only labor that is counted as creating value or being value creating is that which conforms to this social average we talked about earlier. So therefore, socially necessary labor time is kind of this instrument by which concrete labor is pounded down into this homogeneous abstraction in which the worker is forced to work at a pace and in a way and in a fashion and in a form governed by this abstract average that operates behind their backs. So you have the split between concrete and abstract labor. Now, it's the abstract labor that's the substance of value and exchange value. Not concrete labor, that's the substance of use value. So as long as that dual character of labor persists, that is, as long as there's this alienation in the very activity of laboring, in which the worker does not control their own life activity, and instead their life activity is governed by a social abstract average that operates independent of their will and consciousness, you have value production. And once you have value production, it takes on a life of its own and simply seeks to augment more and more value at the expense of the social agents that are engaged in producing that value. So the fundamental solution for Marx is basically a transformation of the human relationships in which sensuous human activity is governed by an abstract equivalent. Another way of saying this is, in capitalist society, we are not in control of time. Time, socially necessary labor time, is in control of us. And this is reverses the whole social meaning of time through human existence. Because what is time in the more generic sense? Time is something that is, is a function of our activity, yes, and through laboring, we, we, we come to an apprehension of the world as containing a, a three-dimensional manifold of time, past, present, future, and it's, it's malleable, it's contingent. It depends upon our needs, natural resources, seasons, bodily variations, etc. Time is a space for human development. But in capitalism, time is no longer the space for human development. Time is, as Marx famously put in the passage, we become time's carcass. We are hollowed out by this abstract time determinant. And therefore, what's fundamentally necessary is to change conditions of labor and of human relationships in which sensuous human activity becomes governed by this abstract social average independent of our will and needs. Once you smash that, once you change that social relationship, then you have the abolition of value production. And then we can start to discuss, ah, now what does a world after value production look like? But if you try to discuss what a world looks like after capitalism without theorizing the abolition of value production, then you get into a hopeless muddle. We have to go right to the, the root of this problem, which is the way in which our labor is abstracted when it goes into the marketplace and it has to compete with others and drive it down. So we have to get rid of this core abstraction out of the system. So in a typical solution for this, how would one work? Well, uh, don't, please, I hope you don't, don't think <laughs> I'm evading your question. I'm going to answer it directly. But first, I have to say a word or two about what's the non-solution that doesn't work. You know, all determination is negation, as Spinoza said, that you know what it is by what it is not. The way you put it was very well put. And because it certainly seems to be that the market is such a big factor in all of this, the standard understanding was, hey, if we control the market, if we eliminate even possibly the market and have a plan instead, a planned economy, then this problem of value production would basically disappear, right? In other words, social agents would come together and plan out distribution and production. There would be no autonomous force that will operate against the worker any longer once you got rid of the market. This was based on a misconception, however, because Marx's critique of capitalism is not fundamentally a critique of the market. Of course, he does critique the market. 
But what Marx asks is what are the social relations that makes the market possible as an overriding social determinant? The market is the phenomena. It's not the essence. In Capital, for instance, he does not begin Capital, the first chapter, the first several chapters. He's not discussing the market at all. He's discussing the social form of labor. See? So if you alter the market relation without altering the dual character of labor, without ending the dual character of labor, then you haven't really solved the problem. The Soviets, for instance, thought, hey, look, we get rid of the capitalist free market, but the mode of production remained pretty much unchanged in the Soviet Union, right, compared to capitalism. The workers didn't have control over the production process. The state did. True, the corporations were gone, but instead of the corporation controlling the workers, the state controlled the workers. So you had a kind of state capitalism replacing private capitalism. There was no more market as we understand it. I mean, they did have really a market, but not in the traditional capitalistic sense. They certainly didn't have a labor market. They had a commodity market of a, of a form, but of a very strange form of commodity market. But the point is, is that the relations of production were not fundamentally transformed. You still had hierarchical social relations at the point of production, the despotic plane of capital dominating living labor, and a, a very sharp class division of haves and have-nots. So, where you have to begin on this for Marx is a transformation of the labor process. Marx is not that interested in the distribution issue. He says, of course, distribution, how you distribute goods and services in a post-capitalist society is important, but that problem will be readily resolved once, but only once, you transform the actual production relations. So, what do you need for that? Well, certainly you have to begin with common ownership of the means of production. That is, you end the situation where there's one class of people who own the means of production and another class of people who are employed in them. Because if you have that separation, then the worker is forced to conform to a form of activity that they may be find very alienating. What does it mean to have social control of the means of production? The Soviets thought, oh, we have social control of the means of production if the state is the owner of the means of production instead of the private individual. But when Marx spoke of the common ownership of the means of production, he meant the producers in charge of the means of production, neither the corporation nor the state. So you need some sort of network of cooperatives in which democracy enters the economic sphere, in which the workplace is itself fundamentally democratized, in which people can organize their production relations in a non-alienated form without an abstract average or abstract form of domination imposing itself upon them and governing their activity. You have to have freely associated labor, not just associated labor, but freely associated relations in which people can figure out how to produce in a way that does not exhibit the dual character of labor. We go back to producing material wealth, but without the split between wealth and value, we go back to engaging in concrete laboring activity, but without the split of concrete versus abstract labor. So that's why Marx's vision of a post-capitalist society is fundamentally democratic. Uh, he's, he, he is, I think, the most, in my argument, the most radically democratic figure in modern philosophy since Spinoza, because he understands that there can be no exit fundamentally from capitalism without social control of the means of production by the producers themselves. In this scenario, we have, let's think about a small country, we have a series of factories or places of work, and people somehow, as a society, figure out before they produce what they're going to produce, what the society needs and then everybody works at this, does their own particular part and gets a certain amount of the produce based on how much work they do. And the work that they do is not judged based on some abstract amount of labor, which makes itself known to the market. It's decided already what we're going to do. And this is what we're going to get. Right. Now, one thing we were, you were talking about earlier and one thing that Marx seems to be extremely impressed with capitalism is about its productive drive. So the problem that we have with capitalism is also its greatest asset is that it always drives its productive forces to increase. Now, how can a socialist system or a communist system or whatever we want to call this new system manage to keep a productive drive and not stagnate? Good. Very good. It all comes down to that four letter word time. You see, in capitalism, the logic of capital, Marx held, 
is you increase value by increasing the amount of output in a given unit of labor time progressively, right? So the relative proportion of living labor to capital at the point of production progressively declines. This is what he says 150 years ago, and of course, nobody can question that this is what's happened in capitalism, right? You used to have uh, these factories in the United States, like Ford Roots, that had 90,000 auto workers in them. Uh, now you'd be lucky to find one with 900, and they're producing much more than the factories with 90,000 ever had, okay? Uh, there's this tremendous wealth creation that capitalism generates through these efficiencies, because it's forced, it's compelled, right, to constantly reduce the relative proportion of living labor to capital at the point of production. Constantly lowering labor costs, constantly trying to squeeze more out of a shorter amount of time. Now, this is a very alienating phenomenon, of course. It's, it's very destructive of the human being. It's also extremely destructive of nature because nature is not counted as a factor in this process, right? Nature is just considered in capitalist economics as an externality, okay, that does not get computed into your cost of production. So the capitalists can produce these great efficiencies but of course, it depends on how you define efficiency, right? Because if you're polluting the atmosphere and you're killing off hundreds of species, uh, well, maybe it's not as efficient as it appears. But in any case, from a certain quantitative level, yes, capitalism is enormously efficient in its way. The question that Marx is interested in is how can that be taken advantage of, however, in a transformed way in a socialistic society? You see, capitalism squeezes down the amount of necessary labor time, and it increases the amount of surplus labor time. That is, the amount of time that's actually needed to reproduce the needs of the individual is progressively shrinking. In a few hours, you can produce perhaps your entire means of subsistence for your entire week, okay? And yet, you're still working long hours. Where does all that extra hours of work go to in value terms? Well, that goes into fueling the productive apparatus that's trying to increase value for its own sake. So Marx sees that one of the beneficiaries of capitalism that lays the material conditions for socialism is that it squeezes down the, the, the amount of necessary labor time needed to reproduce the basic requirements of human existence. Now, in a socialistic society, what does that mean? It creates the material condition in which, once we break with the value integument, we can reproduce our needs in a relatively short amount of time, and the rest of our time is, can now be devoted to non-productive or non-value-producing activities, productive in the capitalistic sense of productive, such as cultural pursuits, pursuing our individual talents, engaging in our relationships, uh, exploring our acquired and innate talents and capacities, etc. Your question, of course, is, but what is going to drive innovation in such a system? That's the key question, that, because capitalism has an answer to that question, right? everything we've been discussing. How are you going to still have innovation in that system? Well, it's like this. Of course, in a workers' cooperative, I guess you can have a situation where workers, let's say, are working 30 hours or 40 hours a week, and then there's another cooperative down the road in which workers are working 20 hours a week and producing the same amount. I guess it would be workers would have the right in such a socialistic or communistic system, according to Marx, to say, hey, instead of working 20 hours a week and producing this much goods and services, we're going to do we're going to work slow. We're going to work 40 hours. They have a right to do that if they want, if they feel that that is more conducive to their human nature and their, their, their needs as individuals. But it's much more likely, he thinks, that people will want to try to have as much free time outside of material production as is possible pursue these multiplicity of human endeavors that is part of human personality. So therefore, actually, he thinks we would look for technologies to reduce the socially or keep the necessary labor time very reduced or even lower it further, not in the service of value production, but in the service of what he calls manifesting a totality of expressions of your human existence. See? So you have a non-alienated society now the focus of your existence is no longer how much money you have and how much goods you consume. The real measure of your existence is how expansive you are as an individual in expressing your abilities. Abilities that have nothing to do, perhaps, with labor or acquisition or material consumption, right? but are still very important for the human being. So the scientific community works on a quite a similar basis, a non-value creating basis. Yes. 
And very often many artists do. Of course, some scientists get sucked into the value system like many artists do as well, very value creating system. I mean, there was a wonderful uh, comment that was, I think it was Whittier, or one of the very first modern artists. It was very early on in the 1830s, I think. He had a painting that he presented in an early uh, showing. And there was this old-fashioned classical art critic that wrote a very nasty review of his painting and said, oh, well, this painting looked like, how long did it take him to make this painting? It looks like a, something a child could have done in four hours. And uh, the, guy, the artist responded by saying, well, actually, yeah, it took me four hours to paint the painting, but it took me 20 hours uh, of looking at the world and, and training myself to look at the world that way to, pre- to produce the painting. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, artists, vary the amount of time they do creating something, or art that scientists as well, right? You, you you try to reduce certain necessary tasks to a minimum, right? And then you try to allow other more creative tasks to consume more of your time, right? That's really the idea that much of us have living today, right? Isn't that what many of us want? Capitalism, however, doesn't allow you to get that. But the irony in capitalism is, even though it reduces the necessary amount of time needed to reproduce your needs, you still don't end up working only eight hours a week, right? You're still working your 50 hours a week. The length of the working day in many industrialized countries is growing for those who have work. And of course, many of those who don't are contingent workers, but they're working two or three jobs, and it adds up to that much if they're trying to maintain a standard of living. Why is that? Why hasn't all this technological innovation brought down the length of the working day? One of the various factors in this, but one of the factors is because the, te- the, the productive system is geared to augment value. If the productive system is no longer geared to augment value, but is geared to augment the expression of human multiple sensuous talents and abilities, it becomes a very different situation. Well, Peter, uh, thanks very much for coming on the show today. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tom. It's been a pleasure. 